So we're glad to have you in Sabbath school this morning. Um, James is going to come up and lead the song here in just a second, but uh, I discovered when we sang our song uh, for the Sabbath school for this month last week that it was very, uh, no one knew it. So I thought I would just say a couple of words about it before we uh, sing it this week. Gary, can you go to the next item on the uh, schedule? This song is an early Advent song, and it's based on one of the texts from last week's lesson, Isaiah 21, 11 to 12. And this is a prophecy that Isaiah is giving against Duma, which is another word for Edom. And he, sa he says, he calls to me out of Seir, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Next verse. Nope, next verse, just the next slide. The watchman said, the morning comes and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, return, come back. And uh, a very dramatic uh, prophecy of the watchman on the wall of Zion uh, keeping an eye out, it's dark, the morning is coming, uh, and, uh, and the message that the watchman is giving is return and come back. This is the message to God's people. They have descended so far into idolatry that this powerful message is necessary to uh, bring them back. So, um, uh, that's a, a good bit of background, and you could read the rest of the chapter, Isaiah tw chapter 21, uh, between Sab School and church, and uh, I think you'd find it very profitable. But this was a song, a song that uh, has at least three different uh, settings in our hymnal that I'm aware of, um, and it meant a lot to uh, the early Adventists, and this is when this particular version that we're singing this month was written was back in the early Advent movement and they regarded themselves as the watchmen calling for people to return and come back to God because in their ways of looking at things Jesus was going to come very soon so um, I'm going to say a word also about the song itself the song has four lines, and if you have a hymnal on your phone, you can look at it, and that helps you to kind of organize it, but it'll, the words will be on the screen. The first line and the second line are pretty much the same melody. And then the third line is similar, but it's lower. So when you sing and you get to the third line, don't go back to where you've been each time. Go down, make your voice drop down a little lower. And then the fourth line comes back up to the same level as before, uh, but then comes to an ending, which is a little, slightly different ending than the, the first two lines. But the lines one, three, and four, one, two, and four are very similar. Line three is lower. So just kind of keep that in mind as we sing. Thank you very much, Dr. Carrico, and good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you all to Sabbath School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the first Tulsa Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad for you, those of you who have come out and braved the weather. I looked at the thermometer before I came on. It says it's nine degrees. Hallelujah. Amen. We're glad that we can come and still uh, worship God. Uh, the psalmist says in one Psalms 122, uh, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we're so thankful that we can come and worship God today. Before we begin, we'd like to have a word of prayer. And uh, before we have our opening song, I should say. So if you would, you'd bow your hearts and your, your mind, and um, we'll have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, this morning, we're so thankful to be called children of God. Glad that you have given us life and opportunity Glad to be watchmen on the walls of Zion. We pray, Lord, that we will uh, advantage ourselves by uh, allowing your blessings to be received by us and to be imparted by us to others while we have time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, our hymn, it is Watchmen on the Walls of Zion. Wow. 
watchman on the walls of Zion, what hotel of us the night? Is the day star now arising? Will the morn soon read our sight? Oh, your vision shine there now's rays of light. Oh, your vision shine there now in rays of light. Tell, oh, tell us all the landmarks on the void of this time. Are we nearing now the heaven? Can in the land be cried? Saints, be joyful, your redemption draw with now. We have found the chart and compass, and are sure the land is near. Onward, places, sound alarm. Let your voices sound aloud, your Lord. Let your voices sound aloud, your holy cheer. Praise God. Sabbath school is, like every other school, a time for learning. And we're learning, reminding the song that we used to sing in the past. Now, uh, our Sabbath school spotlight. So um, we have uh, another... Uh, video today about the mission uh, emphasis for this quarter. The mission emphasis for this quarter is the uh, Euro-Asia division, which is the, area, the countries of the former Soviet Union uh, and includes Afghani Afghanistan. And uh, today is a look back at the last time this union received our offering. Uh, this is from Kyrgyzstan one of those former Soviet uh, republics. How is soccer used for mission in the country of Kyrgyzstan? Winters in Kyrgyzstan are cold, too cold to play outside. But kids love to play year round. So what are kids expected to do all winter? This was a big concern for school leaders at Heritage Christian School. The cold made it hard to have physical education classes. Students had to crowd into a small conference room to exercise. When the weather was nice, the school also hosted a community soccer program for children from low-income families. These kids didn't always have the opportunity to exercise and play sports. In the winter, the soccer field was completely covered in snow. So in 2017, Heritage Christian School asked Adventists around the world to help construct the building. And you answered. This year, we have a special reason to rejoice, because now we have a magnificent building. We were able to build this structure, a multifunctional complex, thanks to the General Conference's 13th Sabbath Offering Project. Students and faculty are thrilled to use the building year-round. It hosts the community soccer program, as well as many other activities. The large building has several meeting areas. An important room is the space where students can gather to talk about their lives and encourage each other. And it doesn't only open its doors to our children and students. We also conduct many programs for teachers, parents, and the community. We invite parents and neighbors to listen to important topics on health, raising children, and strengthening family relationships.
Azamat's parents were worried about his education. He had developed an addiction to his computer and smartphone, and had a hard time focusing on learning. They chose our school, and so Azamat came here. It was difficult to deal with him, because he did not know how to get along with his classmates. He often started quarrels and fights. He was very aggressive, unfriendly, and constantly experiencing anxiety. It was extremely difficult for him. Someone invited him to join the soccer program. The coaches, other children, and the routine taught Azamat how to relate to others and be responsible for his actions. He excelled and learned the sport very quickly. Today, Azamat has changed a lot. He is a wonderful young man who walks with God in his life, trusts him, prays, and asks for wisdom from him, and all thanks to the soccer school. Many lives have been transformed by the influence of this school, and Azamat is just one of them. Thanks to your faithful giving to the 13th Sabbath offering, this building was constructed and is impacting more people than we'll ever know. But God knows each and every one. Watching how the young people change, how their vision of life changes, how the reassessment of values take place. You understand that all this is not in vain. God really has an amazing plan. And we feel amazed that he also chose us to participate in it. Please join us in praying for the people of Kyrgyzstan. May this school have a lasting impact on the community. And thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering, which makes all of this possible. Um, a very uh, uh, worthwhile uh, use for our mission offerings to be put to uh, in the country of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, all these young lives are being positively influenced by their attendance at the Adventist school there and uh, the uh, indoor soccer uh, area is uh, a real benefit to them since they're in such uh, terribly cold weather like we have today but all the time uh, during the winter. Now just a word uh, of apology for those who are seated here in the sanctuary. Uh, we had uh, uh, have had a very mild winter up until this week and uh, we've been very fortunate because our temperature, our, our furnaces have done a fantastic job. However, they're not up to this kind of cold. And uh, so it, yesterday when I came in late in the afternoon, it was 63 degrees in here, even though the furnaces were on. Uh, I turned it up a little further just for good measure. I don't think it really makes any difference, of course. But, uh, and uh, it got 10 degrees or 15 degrees colder overnight, and it was 59 <laughs> degrees when we got here this morning. So our apologies, you'll see people uh, wearing their coats and so forth, uh, maybe their mittens. Um, but, uh, and those who are watching from home, you can be thankful that you're in a nice warm uh, uh, living room in your home. So uh, we'll get right into our lesson study on the book of Isaiah, the gospel prophet. Uh, and if you have uh, a need to... Uh, study your lesson and don't have a Sabbath school uh, lesson uh, study guide, uh, Sabbath school, ssnet.org will get you the study guide in just about any language you can imagine, as well as teachers, quarterlies, and various other uh, versions that the uh, uh, Sabbath school department of the church puts out. And a very handy way to study your lesson, even if you have a Sabbath school quarterly, because you just click on the text and you can have it, see it in any, just about any translation you want. Uh, and uh, saves a lot of time and uh, helps you understand the lessons better. And um, particularly if you're reading the book of Isaiah in the King James Version, uh, the Old English just does not really make it easier for you to understand what it's saying. We love the the sound of the phrases in certain verses, uh, but uh, 
in, in general, it's a little harder to understand. So uh, our lesson today is the defeat of the Assyrians. And this is about Sennacherib and his invasion of Judah. After he had, we, remember we talked about Assyria invaded Israel and Edom. And uh, then uh, Ahaz and Judah tried to pay them off. It didn't work so well. They said, well, if he's got some money uh, to pay us off, we'll just come and take over the country and he can then pay us taxes and uh, we'll just take over everything. So that's exactly what they were planning on doing. And this lesson is about what happened when Assyria came against Jerusalem. And uh, a second hero, or a hero in this, is uh, the king Hezekiah. And we always think of Hezekiah as a good king. Does anyone remember who his father was? Ahaz, who we had have just spent several weeks studying, and Ahaz was a desperately wicked and weak king. And he actually built idols all over the countryside and had people worship God by worshiping those idols. So when Hezekiah became king, he took all those idols down and uh, asked the people to come back to the temple in Jerusalem. And of course, Ahaz had also closed the temple. Uh, but Hezekiah reestablished the worship at the temple, and we're going to get right into this uh, story. Uh, we have David Miller, who's our leader, and Paula Davison, and Robbie uh, Fraser, and we're going to have a good discussion. Uh, this is, uh, in, in, some of the, in some ways, one of the most amazing, disturbing, uh, inspiring stories in the Old Testament. All right, as we uh, open the word today, uh, why don't we just bow our heads, and Brother Robbie, why don't you lead us in a prayer? Heavenly Father, um, despite the cold outside, we're so thankful to be in the warmth of your presence here in your sanctuary. As we open uh, your word and, and look at this story, um, we ask that we learn from it um, and about you and your character and how when, it, when defeat may seem imminent, um, you, you, hold, you hold us in your hand and uh, will reign victorious as you did um, in this story, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much. Amen. Amen. All right. Even though uh, you can see uh, quite a graphic picture here of of a powerful angel coming from the sky that played obviously the big role in the uh, whole title, you can see in our memory verse this week, Isaiah uh, 37 and verse 16. Why don't you uh, share that for us, Sister Paula? It says, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between cherubim, you are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. You know, when you think of, uh, after going through the lesson and looking at the details, if we didn't learn anything else, and we saw this one verse was the only thing we took away from the whole lesson, uh, you would have gotten what needs to be taken. <laughs> that is, who is really in charge? And, uh, you know, who is the one who has all power? Who made everything? And you can see this is a great way in our prayers to approach God. But you could see, you know, um, I heard one pastor put it this way. He said, uh, some of our prayers might be what you would call honest to God kind of prayers. You know, some are... Maybe we just went through a little rhyme we remembered, you know, or this or that. And those might not qualify for honest-to-God prayers. Mm -hmm. But uh, you could see when your back is against the wall, your airplane is going down, or like the disciples when their boat was sinking, Lord, save us, we perish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm so encouraged to see those passages where he says, never does God ever send, do we, he, does he ever miss those prayers. And he always answers, you know, in a way that's going to be the best for him and for you and for the whole situation. So uh, that's, a, that's a powerful thought. Um, our opening lines in Sabbath afternoon gives us more of a rather grim picture of um, the kind of foe, you know, that they're up against. You know, the world superpower of the time, you remember, was a... Um, a, a, a whole kingdom called Assyria. Uh, 
met a young lady who um, was a Christian, and she, a, a powerful Christian now, a Seventh-day Adventist, and she is a Syrian. And uh, so there's still some, some of those people still on the planet. And I had the idea, it was only in the last 50 years or so, that they decided or determined where the Syrian city of Nineveh, I guess that was kind of its Washington, D.C., you know, and, and now I guess Mosul, uh, Iraq is where it was, and I think even, as I understand, even the tomb of Jonah, some think, might even be right near there. But, uh, you know, the story that we see here, I think you might think of it, is couched, you know, that here God had had this, I mean, he has all people, like you say, not willing any should perish. He's interested in everybody, and, you know, and, and those Assyrians were some of them he also was interested in. And so you can also see though that the Bible is couched in a picture of I have a chosen people who are going to follow exactly what I ask them to do and no, no matter where they may come from the ones who decide to follow the one true God are his chosen people you know and that I think was one of the messages he wanted to to get to Israel interesting how he located them I remember when I was in Academy how they talked about God chose Israel to sit on a piece of real estate that at the time was located between where Africa and Europe and Middle East and Asia, all the crossroads of the then known world. This was kind of like the New York City uh, airport, you know, uh, in those days. So that by putting his people there, of course, God's goal was they could be passing the good news of his kingdom to everybody that came through town, like the Queen of Sheba and all the rest. But unfortunately, as we look at the history of, of Israel in the past and Judah, we see such, you know, it's kind of like the story of the porpoise, ups and downs, ups and downs, and then finally, down, down, down. So here we go, Hezekiah. King Ahaz, or Ahaz, joined forces with the Assyrians, and his son Hezekiah has to face the new Assyrian king, Sennacherib, heading for Judah. As I understand um, that the one he took the place of, um, I forget the name right off, but I think it's in the lesson here. He came about about 705 B.C., which would have been less than 50 years after Jonah had come to town. And he and everybody in town repented and said, we want to serve God. The you know, biggest evangelistic meeting of all times that was so, so successful. But you know how we can make decisions, and then sometimes the devil pulls us out of that decision. And that may very well have been what happened to the Assyrian kingdom, you know, that uh, here they are now with Sennacherib, a new leader, and he's taken them in quite another brutal direction. Hezekiah realized, you know, with what he had done to mop up the rest of the world, that, you know, he'd already taken Israel out, and uh, he was coming their way, and uh, you could see he was thinking, God help us. He prepared for battle, and he did what he could to prepare, and you could see here under this yoke with uh, Sennacherib attacked Palestine in 701 B.C. So this would have been, I think, just about four years after um, his forebear had given up the kingdom, and Judah conquered Lachish, a city near Jerusalem. And apparently, in bold reliefs, they show some of the brutal details of how the people that they took and impaled them and stacked up skulls, and it's just terrible how they were treating people that they conquered. And um, so anyway, he prepared the city for war. I mean, he believed that we'll do our part, and uh, we will. Uh, and you, you can see even in the state of Oklahoma, you know, where those Indian tribes located their villages was right along rivers. They knew water was pretty important. And, of course, he realized, too, if this part of the world. If we don't have a water supply, we're going to be in real trouble. It's interesting how in this picture here you see these tunnels that were uh, apparently clearly linked to the time of Hezekiah where he had these tunnels dug to bring water to Jerusalem during a siege. And he was thinking, boy, if he's going to treat those other cities like he treated ours, we're going to be in a siege here shortly. And so you could see uh, in that map on the left that the um, that snake-like route must be the path of those tunnels that I guess are, you can still see the pictures where that fellow is walking through one of these aqueducts or, or a water tunnel 
And of course, you know, even in Jesus' time, when he told the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam, it's down there uh, in that uh, map. You can still see, I guess, as you visit. I've never had the privilege to visit there in the Holy Land, but by picture, we can have opportunity. I think oh. one. I think one thing that I found interesting in reading this part of the lesson is that Hezekiah um, wasn't like his father. He turned and trusted in the Lord, whereas his father didn't do that. Yeah, that was that. That's the big, big, big issue there. That I think uh, again, if we don't learn anything else, but God is the answer, and praise His name, and come to Him, and ask Him when you have your back against the wall, and He'll help you. Yeah, that's great. He did everything he could humanly possible, and it's the same. You know, I heard that someone one time said in a garden, you know, is the closest thing to holding hands with God. You know, he doesn't just bring the seeds and put them in for you and weed it for you and do everything. He gives you a chance to do part of it, and he does part of it. Like the, it, it, it spoke that he talked to his advisors and he brought people in. It wasn't just unilateral decisions either. It was yeah. what, can we, what can we do that's best for these that's people? Right. He, mm -hmm. he consulted military advisors and... Sounds, I'm assuming engineers and stuff too, so. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, here in the 14th year of his reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities. I had the idea from what the lesson author shared, 46 cities had been taken. So you'd think, uh, boy, you know, he was taking them off. Uh, um, so uh, terrible. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to wage war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs. Of course, he was realizing, uh, we need water, I'll fix it for us, but they need water too, and if we cut their stream off, it might uh, impair their ability to attack us. I'm sure that was part of a, what you might consider a military uh, decision. And he worked hard repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it, made up large numbers of weapons, and shields and military officers and assembled them before in the square and, and the big thing he told them was take courage you know be strong and uh, you know you could see the power of good leadership here when it's a Paulus point like he was not like his father like yeah he, he considered preparedness like being spiritually prepared as well absolutely that is that's so crucial and you know it's an important principle too that he was able to have the leader, the, the people stick with him and, and listen to what he said. And I think that was real crucial. I think as God's people face these times too, you know, uh, the church is going to be, again, the object that Satan has special uh, desire to destroy. And so you could see how important it is to press together and be united in the Lord with uh, good leadership. Strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because the king of Assyria and the vast armies with him we got a greater power with us. You know, that same spirit, of course, is the one Jesus shared with his disciples when they whipped out their sword to cut off somebody's ear. He says, hey, no, no, that's not our approach here. Well, we could call 12 legions of angels if we needed to have that kind of military help. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. People gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. So that confidence and leadership you could see was crucial and here at Prophets and Kings. Um, Paula, why don't you share that with us? It says, but the king of Judah had determined to do his part in preparing to resist the enemy and having accomplished all that the human ingenuity and energy could do, he had assembled his forces and had exhorted them to be of good courage. Yeah, well, there we go, that's, that's great. Good lesson for us all. All right. Now, it's interesting when he was taking another one of these uh, cities, how he, uh, you can see Sennacherib didn't go himself, but he uh, picked his chief of staff to go down. You know, military now still uses what they call psyops. Have you ever heard of a psyop? Psychological operation. Yeah or they uh, work on your mind. Uh, you know, we could tell them that we're big and strong and we're powerful and we'll drop leaflets over the people and they can look at those and say, oh, makes us scared. And so if you could get people talked into just collapsing without having to use military power, that's the best, you know. Some might call it diplomacy, but you know, you could see uh, he sent his field commander down to intimidate the people 
talk them into rebelling against Hezekiah and handing the city over. In other words, it looks like the same strategy Satan might use on God's people if we could, you know, like Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And the uh, same is true. And here's, you can see his little, uh, <laughs> his little lies he put out there uh, and his true things. You know, in a way, Satan has the same kind of package for us, doesn't he? Where he'll kind of commingle truth with error. And, uh, and so anyway, you can't trust Egypt. Well, that's a true story. <laughs> But then he said, you can't trust God either. Why, well, Hezekiah offended him by tearing down his places of worship. And, you know, that really wasn't a true story because, you know, what happened was apparently some of the places he did take down, one of them was something that Moses apparently had made that snake of brass and had it on a pole. And the people weren't to worship the brass. They were to look to the snake, and that was to represent Jesus. And then they would look and live, and the snakes wouldn't kill them. Well, they had taken that snake and turned it into a little deity itself, and they were alter, uh, offering incense to the brass snake, Nehushtan. <laughs> and so he took that out. But anyway, uh, then another one he pointed out, you don't have enough. You don't really have an, <laughs> a very big military, you know. You have just such a feeble little force. And you say, well, that's a true story. We did have only <laughs> a little military compared to 185,000 out here. <laughs> so, so uh, and then you could see, too, God's on a serious side. Well, you know, at one point, obviously, he was interested in saving the Assyrians and giving them opportunities and sent Jonah down there and with a great deal of effort to get Jonah to even go to be. You can see why Jonah might be a little hesitant to go visit this kind of neighborhood. <laughs> But anyway, he did go, and he shared, and it was successful at, at a point. And then you'll starve because of the long siege. Well, if that would have been a long siege, that's, that's very true. But God, of course, even there, if you have your trust in him, all things are possible. Half-truths, lies, he was able, unable to convince the people, and they trusted God's power and remained faithful. That was, that was probably the, one of the biggest miracles, is that you had a group of people that remained faithful to to God through this. All right. I'd like to um, share this um, quote I found in Ellen White under this day's lesson. It's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 742. And it says, If our faith is fixed upon God through Christ, it will prove as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered. It is true that disappointments will come, tribulations we must expect, but we are to commit everything great and small to God. He does not become perplexed by our multiplicity of grievances nor overpowered by weight of our burdens. His watch care extends to every household and encircles every individual. He is concerned in all our business and our sorrows. He mocks every tear. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. All the afflictions and trials that befall us here are permitted to work out his purpose of love towards us, that we might be partakers of his holiness and thus become participants in that fullness of joy which is found in his presence. Yeah, that's quite a picture. That's quite a picture. Again, it points us back to where our real strength lies, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes. So here we go with the New International Version in Isaiah 36. Actually, 36, 37, 38, and 39 are the last four chapters where Isaiah is kind of describing, you know, um, here's what's going to happen to you all as you choose to go down this wrong path that you have picked out. God's message for them, a sad picture overall. But then by ver chapter 40, you know, up to 66 is, but... <laughs> You know, uh, after I've given you such sad messages, let me tell you, I'll be with you through the storm. <laughs> I'm not going to depart. So those are going to be, I'm sure, some of our lessons on down the road here. But here we are in 36. The king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field, the field commander said to Hezekiah's officials, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. 
And then, of course, he went through that whole deal that we were just mentioning there earlier about uh, all these empty words and, man, this is going to be bad for you and on and on and don't lean on Egypt. And, and so uh, and here Hezekiah has been taking God's uh, business down so he can't lean on God anymore. And, of course, he was trying to, again, reduce their confidence in, their, in the true God. You could see it may be that Sennacherib himself had been one of those 120,000 people that at one point, he, he seemed to know quite a bit about the Jewish people and the true God at this point. But anyway, furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country. Now, wasn't that kind of bold to say? Very bold. <laughs> you know, uh, somebody that said this could maybe be likened in some ways to Goliath and David. Where here is, you know, this big giant with all of his armed soldiers and then this little more motley crew. And in some ways you kind of think, well, that's, if you take all the Seventh-day Adventists in the world and you take the over one billion, quote, Christians in the world and then all the non-Christians, you'd say, well, if God wants this little group of only 20 million people to be the ones that bear a message to the whole world. And some people think, well, that's just kind of a little sect over there. How can they have a truth, you know? But if they're building on the word, that's the good question, you know? That's the one that, of course, is gonna, uh, we know that uh, the word is everything to us. And uh, Jesus, of course, is the living word. All right, so, uh, so anyway, as the commander replied, was it only your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the people sitting? I think the whole notion it was, let, we want everybody on the wall to hear this, spread it around. And, you know, you could say, well, how did they take this message? You could see, were they a little bit scared? It seems like maybe he was trying, like the, Fear the, the, he the Hebrews were trying to do a little bit of damage control. Like, just tell us, like, don't, <laughs> no need to... To, to talk to our people, can you just talk to us? We'll understand if you say it in your language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could see that uh, what they also, what it tells you is both groups knew that psychological operations and propaganda does have an impact on people. Mm -hmm. And if, if that wasn't true, it, or clear up until 2021, they wouldn't be using those kind of efforts to influence people. And you'd think, well, what about when you go back to heaven where Lucifer said, I'm going to get a psychological operation going against God. I'm going to start whispering around to all these other angels and tell them what he's really like and, you know, spread bad stories about him. And, you know, to think that one-third of heaven was convinced, it tells you how powerful psychological operations can be if Satan's behind the scenes. Powerful. So as you say that, I'm going to pose this question, what should we do about that? Yeah, it seems you know, to how, me how that? that going back to the word, what does it say? Heaven and earth's going to pass away, but his word won't. And if what they're saying doesn't go with this book, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have something to stand on if you hold on to this. You're not going to if you don't, it seems to me. So yeah, the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear are the words of the great king. This is what the king says, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He can't deliver you. Well, that by himself, that's certainly true, but... Don't let him persuade you to trust in the Lord. But yes, uh, they were willing to let him put their trust in the Lord. And the Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then, oh man, look what we'll do for you. We'll give you fruit and your own fig trees and vines and water and cisterns. And oh, you'll be like in heaven. Come join us. So, so similar an argument to like what Satan used in the garden, you know, God said this, but I'm telling you this too, you know, sure, did God say this? Like, you don't have to trust God. Like, we're going to give you this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he immediately goes to like their immediate needs, like food and shelter and mm -hmm. comfort. Mm -hmm. And that's what Satan does too. Satan never comes at you with a long view of things. It's, it's immediate temptation, mm -hmm. your, your immediate hunger or, or what some emotional need in the moment, but if you mm -hmm. look to God, God always has the long view, um, and, and you, you can kind of like her quote said, you know, there, there will be trials and there will be mm -hmm. things, but God has the long view. He's going to carry you through mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think too, when you realize, you know, as we approach the end and we see that some, I think there are many who look at you look at the book, you see the prophecies that are coming, and you see where we are now, and you say, ooh, it looks like we're getting closer to the end. <laughs> you know, that we're not as far away from Jesus' return. And one of the things that Adventists have been told is, 
you know, one of the things that if we sort of don't make a point that whatever God invites us to do, we're willing to do by his power and continue to move in his direction rather than say, well, you know, that's a little tough to do that instruction. It's too tough to do that one. And so when you get, when push comes to shove and they say, okay, now those who go to church on this day will be given these privileges. Those who go to church over here will be given those privileges. And then it comes down to, well, you couldn't buy or sell if you don't do what we tell you that your liberties will be taken and your privilege, your economic, you might call it economic boycott is imposed on you. And there's one passage where she says, because of the lack of being able to buy food or clothes, many of God's people will say, well, we've just got to have food and clothes, so we're going to go this way. And so you, you can see we should pray while we still have opportunity to make those kind of provisions and decide what will God do to preserve us, just like he did for them. Absolutely. I, I think sometimes, um, and I agree with you, I said that first, but I think sometimes we look more at the bigger picture. I think we have to look at those little things day by day that's whether it. we that's do it. it. Absolutely. You know, um, I believe in the prophecy, but the pennies make the dollars. Right. And even if, I, and I'll say something as I say as little as choosing what day to go to work. Should you be working on Sabbath for instance? Well, absolutely. You know, um, it's those little things and I think as as we learn to trust God and those little things, those bigger things become a little bit easier. So absolutely. Work. Absolutely. I think it's that big issue that you just mentioned is the one that Satan is going to use right up at the very end to kind of separate the sheep from the goats in a yes. way. I was taken just kind of in reading this, like this, these people are, are bullies and mm. you know, I've, I've been talking to my son and you know, sometimes kids at school will say something and it's like, well, what, what they're saying isn't true. Like what is the truth? And the truth is these, these were God's people. God promised them and God had delivered on the promise. And all the things that he was saying is, you know, um, it's just such a, if you look at it, have the gods of the nations delivered them he wasn't talking about their God. Their God was not these other gods. Those other gods did not have the capacity to deliver them, mm -hmm. and, and their God did. And so it's just sort of like when you build a foundation through the small decisions, it, it, it stands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Tuesday's lesson goes in here to shaken but not forsaken. So you could see the impact of... Sennacherib's buddy, Rabshake, who came and uh, told them these things. Did it have an impact on them? Oh, it shook them, didn't it? They were kind of shaken, shaken to the core, as it points out here. Mourning and distress has got kind of turned to God. Wouldn't that be something if always God's people did the same thing when the chips were down? Mm -hmm. To think, Lord, help us. We're in trouble. Think of Jacob. You remember the story of Jacob and the time of trouble that he was going through, thinking his brother was getting ready to take advantage of him with 400 armed men on the other side of the Jabbok. So remember, he prayed all night, and he just finally realized he was wrestling with God. And then, of course, he held on so tight, you know, with faith to believe, God, I'm not going to turn you loose until you give me the promised blessings that you have. And uh, he came through with peace in his heart. And, you know, God's people are going to go through that same kind of experience. So... Uh, God answered immediately. Go ahead. As, as I'm reading about this section about being shaken, as we all be shaken, mm -hmm. and and um, I think in uh, Mount of Blessings, I was reading about how it's um, us depending on God. We are going to be shaken. We Absolutely. have to accept that we're going to be shaken. But when we try and take those things into our own hands, we try and deal with that's where the problem that's comes the in. Problem. And trying to release that and give it to God. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for us to. I'll say me, let me talk about myself and everybody else, but it's hard for us, for me to figure out, is this what God wants? And yes, I have a relationship, but it's being tested. It's Absolutely. being tested and trying to hold on to what it is and um, putting our hands in God's hands. I think we um, may have talked about him holding our right hand. You know, that's what we have to hold on to. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Uh... So anyway, there we go. God's answer, God, God's answered immediately. He was on the side of his people. Isaiah predicted Sennacherib would hear rumor that would distract him from his attack on Judah, verses 6 to 7. So that's, you know, you could see how God's prophet is one of the things that you could depend on. And of course, we also have God's prophecies to depend on. And uh, even God hasn't left his people in the end times without prophetic utterances to give us guidance into the details of what's mm -hmm. coming down the pike. 
Nobody's had more light shined on our path. And we want to be sure we don't end up falling off the wagon like the Assyrians did after all 120,000 said, we'll follow him. But so, if we do fall off, we do God's fall off. there for us. And that's so nice there, isn't it? First John 2, where it says, you know, we don't need to fall, but if we do fall, mm -hmm. we have an advocate. Like, yes. I'm holding the trampoline for you, and I'll catch you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's so encouraging. Mm -hmm. And, and all we like sheep have gone astray, so how many fell off? <laughs> it's pretty inclusive, isn't it? Yes. So, um, shaken but not forsaken. Sennacherib sends threatening letters to Hezekiah just before leaving Judah. Hezekiah brings these letters before God, asking him for liberation and acknowledging him as a holy. Where did he go to pray? To the temple. It looks like he's right up here on the. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, asking him for liberation and acknowledging him as the holy king and the creator. It's interesting that he didn't come in and just say, you know, save my hide, Lord. That's all I'm interested in. <laughs> it was, again, pointing to the creator God. And God, look, look at all these nations. What would they think if your people are squished off the map? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think of it even in a bigger sense. God said to Adam and Eve, I am going to send a, a seed that is going to save you from your sins, basically. And he's going to crush. I mean, they're going to, they're going to bite his heel, but finally somebody's head's going to get squeezed. In other words, somebody's going to win this battle. And it's pretty clear, even in Genesis 3, how that was going to tip, you know, that God had it fixed out, that he was going to save his people. Who would like to share a little bit of that? Of course. Uh, starting verse 1. Uh, when King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloths, to the prophet Isaiah. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says, this day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace. When the children come to the moment of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may, it may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for, his, for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives. When Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord said. Do, do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words which the underlings of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country. And there I will have him cut down with the sword. You could see uh, God was giving even a little bit of extra information. You don't need to worry about this fella. I've got him, uh, you know, taken care of. Don't worry about the human uh, elements or the ones, the powers that Satan stirs up even against God's people at any time, including ours, that uh, we have nothing to fear for the future. I think we've been told except we forget his teaching in the past and, and his, uh, how he has dealt and helped us in the past, his, his word, you know, what, uh, you could see this word we're told is given to us upon whom the ends of the world are come. So this is our instructions. I like it when it says here in verse 14 that he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. You know, what, sometimes when we have difficulties, maybe we should just be coming here to the church, spreading up before the Lord. It doesn't have to be on the Sabbath. I mean, it might be during the week we have something going on, if we have a key for the church or whatever. But coming to church and being spread out before the Lord, I think, does something for us. I think that's very, very possible. And it's true, too, that even if um, we're not at the church, even a little prayer, I think she says, wherever we are, sending up a little prayer to heaven in workplace or wherever, this pray without ceasing concept, yes. he is with us and he's I helping us. I think, too, it's like he's a, he's a king and he left his his throne room and mm -hmm. went to God's throne room yeah, absolutely. Hum humbly, you know, like mm -hmm. ag ag acknowledging like, God, God is the real king here. Who's mm -hmm. the king of kings and lord of lords? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting. Uh, you wonder if there's any world leaders who would fit into that category at this time. And I would guess the enemy's been real good at trying to enlist them on his side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words. 
Sennacherib had sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these people. It's true. That's a true part of it. They've thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods. They were only wooden stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hands so that all the kingdoms of this earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. And you could see, again, bringing glory to God's name was, was, the, was a good part of his decision at that point. So, uh, and what it did, what it did for helping. Now, here's the rest of the story. I think you remember the commentator Paul Harvey. Um, some people in our group here may not remember hearing Paul Harvey when they were little. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> you, oh, okay. And so he would sometimes at the end say, I'll give you the rest of the story. And of course, the rest of the story, uh, um, usually some kind of heartfelt picture of somebody who, you know, the dog that had been separated from its master and found his way a thousand miles back home or something like that. Well, here's a story here, uh, the, the rest of the story. You want to share that with us? Um, it says, Satan wanted to humiliate Judah to prevent the birth of, of the Messiah and the redemption of the world. If Sennacherib had conquered Jerusalem, he would have got his way. Sennacherib engraved his victory over Lachish on the wall of his palace. He bragged about having locked Hezekiah, Hezekiah up like a bird in a cage. However, he could not say he had defeated Hezekiah or conquered Jerusalem. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, that our lesson author, his wife, is a um, Mesopotamian archaeologist. <laughs> And so uh, some of the details that they share together as a team, and he also teaches this language that the Assyrians, he teaches at our Adventist seminary that Akkadian language that they speak. So you can see they're both very, <laughs> this, this is right down their alley, so to speak, when they're sharing this with us this time. But you could see uh, when he left, Sennacherib left a contingent of his army to lay siege to Jerusalem. Uh, 185,000 of those soldiers were killed by an angel, of course, not mentioned in his bragging mural about conquering Lachish. The king met his own death when he returned to his city. God had won. You know, of course, that's sometimes propaganda is used in portraying, putting a twist. You know, even in our own country, they talk about various uh, political offices that have what they call kind of a spin machine. Like we can take whatever news comes out and we can make it look best for us or somebody else will take the same and twist it and make it look best for them. Mm -hmm. You know, that still goes on. And this apparently happened with, look what I did with all these cities. And he showed clearly, here's Lachish with all the carnage. And you know how we tore that place to shreds and we took over. But what did he say about, what did he say about old, uh, he has a guy, well, I just put him in a birdcage. <laughs> Why didn't you take your birdcage home with you? <laughs> the encouragement that these people had going to bed, say, one night, knowing that mm -hmm. these people mm -hmm. were outside. Yeah. They wake up the next morning and uh, dead. Like, uh, just just a, a change. And it, kind of like the, the, the core verse said, you know, um, and we'll go on to it when, when God did this sign, but God held it all. God, God had it all. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, it's... What do you Everything in the Bible, really simple <clears throat> if you acknowledge, but also so profound. God, God has it all. Yeah, no question about it. And you, you could see from God's side, you could see and from his kingdom and from his name being glorified, it seems like <clears throat> when, when Goliath came and said, you know, defy the, the uh, God of Israel, and David, of course, uh, said, no, we don't talk that way about our God. You know, he has going to be in charge. And it seems like when you, when you have these bold, blasphemous charges thrown in God's face, he is willing to some, somehow, again, make it clear, especially when his people will request, um, we want your name glorified, God, that he comes through. And, of course, don't think that uh, 185,000 soldiers were the whole, not only did Sacharib, uh, go home, so to speak, with his tail between his legs back home. The rest of the nations heard that story too. Don't, don't think that for a minute. That didn't get out. And so the question comes at the bottom on Wednesday's lesson. Some 
may wonder, what do you say to someone who not yet believing in the Bible or the God of the Bible asked this question, was it fair that these Assyrian soldiers who just happened to be born where they were should die in mass like this? How do you personally understand the Lord's actions here? Not as easy a question to answer, is it? <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you look at all the Bible stories and you see uh, some of these nations were whole nations, of course, you know, and it's interesting the carnage that takes place during war times, kinetic war. It's terrible, terrible things that have happened. And um, I, I would just say, as, as I read that, it made me think about, um, first of all, this, this one angel that kills all these, um, mm -hmm. these people. And then it, it took me back to... Um, Moses in Egypt and when the blood and the doorpost and that one angel but those people made a choice not to fall and similar here people are making a choice mm -hmm. not to fall so that one destroying angel can destroy but you made that choice no I think and, and you know I think it helps to go back in that history 50 years before when the whole city had heard about the true God and the whole nation apparently had decided to stick with that and they had headed down this path again to destroy mm -hmm. the very one who had brought them the hope of eternal life through this the lord and so i do think that the choice and then the very fact that them you know take trying to take god's people out was part of that but you know i think the character of god does come into it even in this whole picture because some people well you know not even say well um, God doesn't, does, God doesn't kill. I've even heard that doctrine, but that's really not a biblical doctrine. Right. You know, it that's appears right. real clear that at the very end of time, I think this was put in for us to realize there comes a time when all those people who have turned their back, just like it was before the flood, only evil and evil continually is all they could think of. They'll be removed like the mm -hmm. flood took them away. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the end, we know fire will totally cleanse the world. But in this situation, this 185,000, one thing that you can see here, just like an anesthesiologist, it appears that these people may have been asleep in their tents that night. And it may be that God just kind of unplugged their breather and they just faded out. We don't see that God took these people and put them on poles and poked it up through their chests like the Asterians did to, and stacked skulls up to show how many uh, trophies we have like they were famous about doing. You could see the mercy of God comes through in all of that. But at the same time, the justice part of his character, it seems to me right. that they're perfectly balanced. And part of, God's, part of God's love is the mercy and the justice. And, you know, even, even the just, 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 if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So nice. In sickness and in wealth, as we're coming to the end here, you could see... I'm talking about all of us that sometimes fall off the bandwagon. Uh, it looks like Hezekiah had a time in his life where it looked like he was going to die. And uh, they didn't think uh, he would survive. God told, even through the prophet Isaiah, God says, you'll be gone here. And do you think, Isaiah, do you think Hezekiah took that well? If God told you it's time for you to go, what would you tell him? Robbie? And a little more time, please. <laughs> well, I actually that's our natural re response. It I is, think. it is. But I, I kind of looked at a, a, a little differently. I was talking to someone about this last night. And if God says, well, this is how much time you have left. It's your time to go. Well, thank you, Lord. I'll prepare myself. Because he said, make your, make your house in order. Put your house in order. So put Absolutely. your house in order. But I don't fault Hezekiah for asking for more time no, either. No, absolutely. But you if can I see. knew that this is, this is it, this is all you got, then I'm going to get my house in order. But I could be bold like Hezekiah mm -hmm. and ask for more time. And you can see, and we can look in retrospect and see if, if Hezekiah had accepted God's advice, his son Manasseh, which was the very most wicked mm -hmm. king that ever came into Judah's situation, would never have been born. Right. And uh, God could have dried up evil in some way. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, so you, you could see, you could see that, uh, so anyway, so God worked out a, a deal, and of course, he, he was spared, and there was a miracle, a miracle signified by another miracle, the son went back because of his request, and, and uh, those were some of the details that, uh, that fell into it. This passage here, um, on Friday's lesson, where it says, the how when these visitors from Babylon came 
and he showed him everything and part of his pride that rose to the top unfortunately this pride and vanity took possession of Hezekiah's heart and in self-exaltation he laid open to covetous eyes the treasures with which God had enriched his people the king showed them the house of his precious things the silver the gold the spices precious ointment all that was found in his treasures there was nothing in his house uh, nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not Isaiah 39 2 not to glorify God did he do this but to exalt himself in the eyes of these foreign princes mm -hmm. and so you could see of course God made it real clear to him after that now uh, you because you weren't prudent in your wisdom for your nation for me or for yourself you know the Babylonians are I'm not gonna let the Assyrians take you out but the Babylonians will eventually do what needs to be done so God was just even with his own people in allowing that kingdom to be destroyed completely too and, and not totally destroyed you remember he kept alive that thread through Jesus that uh, provided and uh, Hezekiah of course uh, was was uh, given a recovery for his temporal and at some point it almost seems a little selfish to say oh good well if if it's going to be destroyed, it won't be while I'm still alive. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Self kind of comes in there mm -hmm, again a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. But, but you could see we're all humans, and uh, we're so thankful that God puts these stories of real people with real challenges like we have in there to, to be lessons for us mm -hmm. as we see the end approaching. So uh, why don't we just say a prayer that God would be with us and help us to make wise choices in these challenging times too. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the living word that was willing to come down here and that unto us a child was born, a son was given, and the government's going to be on his shoulders. We can hardly wait for that government to be set up. We just pray it'd be in our hearts first and that we could be found faithful as we see some of these same events that we're going to face where a time of trouble such as the world has never seen will come upon the world, where there'll be carnage similar to what convulsed Jerusalem and France in the past. And we are so thankful that you've promised to hold us by hand they won't let go, and that you'll be with us till the end. And we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget how you've led us in your teaching in our past history. Amen. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen.